Hello and welcome to the Katie Helper Show. I'm your host, Katie Helper. We have such a great show for you today. We will be talking to Winnie Wong, a founder of the People for Bernie and one of the main organizers of the People Summit, which will be happening this weekend in Chicago. And it'll feature speakers including Bernie Sanders. And we speak to someone else who will be speaking at the People Summit, but he's so much more than just a speaker. He's Ben Jealous. Ben Jealous was the youngest president ever of the NAACP, and he came on the Katie Helper Show was a great guest. He predicted that Trump would win on the Katie Halper show just hours before it happened. Ben Jealous was also a surrogate for Bernie Sanders during the 2016 presidential campaign. And we talked to him on this episode about his decision to run for governor of Maryland. And guys, if you're in Chicago, I'll be there. So look out, follow me on Twitter, letter K, letter T, H-A-L-P-S. That's KT Helps. I'll be live tweeting and live periscoping. That's videoing. I'll be doing some Facebook live. So make sure you go to facebook.com slash Katie Helper Show and you'll see me reporting live from there. Whatever you do, do not forget to donate to WBAI so you can get tickets to that great show that we're doing June 14th at the Brooklyn Commons. That's Wednesday, June 14th at the Brooklyn Commons at 388 Atlantic Avenue. Go to facebook.com slash the Katie Helper Show and you will see a pin status that lets you click on a link which brings you to a WBAI link. And there you will see a show, and you just donate $10, and you get to come to that show. And the guests will be Freddie DeBoer and Angela Nagel, and then stand-up and storytelling from Marie Faustin, Gabe Pacheco, Michelle Carlo, and more. And then wrap it all up with some karaoke. Honestly, what could be better? So we're so excited to be talking to Winnie Wong, a kick-ass organizer, a founder of People for Bernie, organizer of the People Summit, which is happening this weekend in Chicago. So, Winnie, thank you so much for joining us. And can you tell us a little bit about the People Summit? Um, well, I mean, we're expecting 4,000 people, um, activists, progressives, public intellectuals, academics, writers, authors, you know, uh, you know, uh, personalities, um, to come together uh, in really the wake of Bernie's political revolution to talk about what sort of concrete steps that we need to take um, in order to build a a broad front um, to inform our democracy, which I think is in shambles now. So, I mean, (laughs) this is, you know, it's a monumental task, but I think that like we've assembled a a really, um, you know, incredible um, roster of um, speakers um, and we put together a very, very um, thoughtful program um, for attendees and participants. And so we're, we're very excited. You know, we're excited, you know, obviously that the senator is, is going to be addressing the, uh, the crowd on Saturday at 7 p.m. Um, in the keynote address, uh, which will be about 90 minutes long, which will include a Q&A, which is great. Uh, and we're, we're expecting that that speech will be very uh illuminating and also um, inspiring. So we're, 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 we're really thrilled that he's, that he's joining us. And of course, by the senator, when he is referring to the senator of Vermont, Bernie Sanders. Senator Bernard Sanders, who would have won? Yes, Bernie, who would have won Sanders, exactly. <laughs> um, so who are some of the speakers and what are some of the panels? We have over 130 speakers uh, confirmed. Uh, and they are, you know, or they really like they range from being, you know, community organizers um, in the Midwest to elected officials such as Ro Khanna uh, and people who are thinking of um, who are not thinking of running, running for office, but who are actually running for office um, in the case of Ben Jealous, who is also on this episode of the Katie yes. Halper show. Um, so, you know, Linda Sarsour speaking. Um, Sarah Jaffe, the the, the journalist, uh, big friend of the show. That's right, big friend of the show. Um, Ro Khanna, uh, Naomi Klein, Bill McKibben, Christine Pellegrino, who who was recently um, elected to uh, the Assembly here in New York, uh, New York State. She was a Bernie delegate and an educator, and, and decided to you know throw her hat in the ring and ran a, a, a really insurgent campaign and, and won and flipped the seat. And now she's going to be Andrew Cuomo's worst nightmare. She'll Same. be there. She's great. The for Teach Out is, is coming. Yay. Um, you know, it's like, it's, it's, it's everyone, you know, it's, it's all the people that you, that you know and love from the movement um, and more. We have Dallas Goldtooth from Standing Rock coming. Nice. Um, Chuck, Chuck Lumumba. 
just confirmed, so he's going to be joining us uh, on Friday night. All of the Women's March co-chairs are coming. Will you come out, right? Oh, and Kamal is coming, who has also been on your show. Nina Turner. Um, Love Nina. Yeah, yeah. Nina. Nina has the Sunday. Nina's going to start Sunday off uh, with, a, with a really um, special Wake Up with Nina Turner program. So nice. just be ready for, okay. for those of you like tuning into the live stream. Nice. Yeah, so we have, you know, like lots of really sort of marquee speakers, but also like incredible organizers who are, uh, you know, who've been doing like this work for a long time who are lesser known, but just as important. Right. And we are making sure that like the panels represent a diversity of voices um, and experiences. Uh, and so, you know, we have really uh, curated a very, very, very um, jam packed program for both Saturday and Sunday. So, you know, expect panels uh, to, to really tackle um you know, the issues that like this current administration are really like focused on right now, such as like rolling back like net neutrality, right? There's a right. really important panel on winning, winning the internet, winning the battle for the internet, um, which has like some of the best internet freedom organizers um, in the progressive movement who will be leading that session. Um, Becky Bond, who you've had on your show, who yes, is a her. great friend of mine and yours. She's the greatest. She's on the program uh, three times. Nice. Um, <laughs> So she's represented, uh, you know, twice on Saturday and then on Sunday she's on a program uh, on a panel with Tom Frank. And, uh, yeah, so just uh, Dave Zirin's coming. You, I mean, you, it's it, at every it's going to be overwhelming. It's going to be um, a very, uh, you know, fun uh, environment, but also an environment for people who are um, not from the left like you and I. Uh, and the people who are presenting, but for people who 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 were introduced to Bernie um, in 2016 and and really signed on to his, his political revolution, they're they're getting a chance to um, participate uh, and learn and uh, make friends because this this is a really a, an opportune time to build relationships right within the grassroots community. Um, and so for those folks, I think it will be very very. Um, illuminating and so i'm i'm very happy about about the people who are like less embedded in our in our community right like of the left we right. we all know each other for the for the most part but there are thousands of people coming from across the country who have never really been a part of the left right um and we're very excited to to really um welcome those folks uh and have them start you know organizing and plugging into the different uh convening organizations um to start like you know, taking back, taking taking back, like what is perishing in the dumpster fire right now? Right. Our democracy. Well, Winnie, thank you so much, and we're gonna catch up with you more um, at the conference at the People Summit. Yes. Yes, and, I can't wait. I'm, yeah. I'm so stoked that you're coming. And yes. We're we're gonna have a great time. Thanks awesome. so much, Katie. Thanks, Bye. Winnie. Bye. That was Winnie Wong, a founder of the People for Bernie and one of the key organizers of this weekend's People Summit in Chicago. Now we talk to another person who will be at the People's Summit, Ben Jealous, about his run for governor of Maryland. So, so excited to be talking to Ben Jealous, who has thrown his hat into the ring, running for governor of the great state of Maryland. So, Ben, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. And Ben, of course, made history on the Katie Halper Show when he predicted that uh, Donald Trump could uh, possibly win the presidential election. Why are you running and why should people vote for you? Katie, I, um, I decided to run, frankly, after traveling the state, listing the families across the state. It became clear, you know, that the same onks run through families, black, brown, Asian, white, Native American, rich, poor. It's kind of surprising, but, you know, we saw it in the Bernie rallies, we saw it in Trump rallies. For sure it was there in Hillary rallies, too, certainly in the general it was there. It's this concern, not in the stomachs of parents and grandparents, that their children, their their grandchildren's generation will be the first generation of Americans to be condemned as a generation, to be worse off educationally, economically, than generations before. And we see as our birthright in this country that every generation should do just at least somewhat better off than the ones we be for. That's you know what the the arc that the American dream is supposed to provide for us. The American dream is rusting. And at the same time, our federal government 
every branch has been taken over by extreme right-wing conservatives. And so it leaves us progressives who typically have invested in the power of the federal government looking in these times for, you know, how do we move forward despite the federal government, even on things like fighting climate change and signing on to the Paris Accord. And it's against that backdrop that I've decided to run. You know, as an organizer, as a community organizer, civil rights leader, somebody who spent their entire life working with folks in community, trying to figure out how we move forward together, I see a real opportunity uh, for us to build a movement um, to win this governor's race in a way that will make our movement stronger on the other side, make it easier for us to govern. You know, as I was, when I was a young community organizer in Harlem as a kid, I was taught, you know, we don't elect somebody to make change happen. We, may, we elect somebody to make it easier for our movement, for our community organization to make change happen. And so that's what I'm seeking to do here is to build a movement, take back this governorship from the Republicans and make it easier ultimately for our movements to get things done on behalf of our children, on behalf of our families, on behalf of our communities. And what direction do you think the Democrats are moving in and, and how has Bernie Sanders uh, influenced that? Or- you know, Bernie has revived the other half of the equation, um, you know, sort of betrothed to us by the great and the moral leaders of the Democratic Party, and people like RFK and MLK, um, who, you know, were not, you know, the case, for instance, of Robert F. Kennedy, in, in, throughout the span of his career, obviously, he evolved and progressed, but, but he, he ultimately got to the same place that Martin was at, same place that Shirley, Shirley Chisholm was at, Barbara McCulkey here from Maryland. And in each of these cases, these leaders um, came to a moral place on civil rights, often pushed by Dr. King, but they also came to a moral place of fighting poverty and expanding opportunity. And Bernie has reminded a lot of people in the party that we're at our best when we are about both. And we're not just at our best because we're dealing with great moral crises like discrimination and poverty uh, and and the urgent need to expand opportunity and, and access to the American dream, but we're literally at our best politically because there are some voters, a lot of voters, who are motivated by uh, winning civil rights battles. And I'm one of them. But there's also a lot of voters who are simply interested in just ensuring that they can get to move their family out of poverty. And that was my, you know, and and that was my family a couple generations ago. My mom started life in the housing projects here in West Baltimore. And I have lots of cousins who are like, look, man, I, you know, I'd like to have the privilege uh, to actually be discriminated against getting a loan. But, you know, <laughs> for that to happen, I'm going to have to get a job that pays better, right? So, um, you know, we, uh, when we do both, we're unstoppable. Um, when we neglect our responsibility uh, as progressives to fight and win big victories to help lift people out of poverty and expand opportunity, make it easier for them to start a small business even, Uh, then we start to lose folks. And recent polls have shown that, you know, that I think was Priorities USA. Big mystery. Why do these white voters vote for Obama twice and then vote for Trump? Big mystery. Why do these black voters vote for Obama twice and not show up? Newsflash, according to the poll, in each case, well, it felt like Democratic leaders had betrayed them on the economy. Right. Why is that so hard for people to understand or admit? Uh, Can you expand on that? This idea that somehow economic issues are separate from racial justice issues. I mean, I feel like I'm okay. I'm not that old, but I feel like I've never seen that articulated this kind of connect disconnect or disconnection that people are claiming. So this is the crazy thing that, is that, you know, know, look, I'm of the tradition, like Reverend Barber in North Carolina, like, and, you know, Dr. King, if somebody says to you, well, what is it? Is it race or it's class? You just say yes. Right. You know, like, the reality is, is that, um, you know, the the two things have been completely interconnected throughout our entire existence, right? They, you know, um, 
are woven as closely together as slavery, as slavery and indentured servitude and the genocide of Native Americans, right? Like, you know, the reality is that people at the bottom of the colonial economy, um, you know, were, were being mistreated in profound ways across the color spectrum. And yes, slavery was incomprehensibly inhumane and indentured servitude was different, but they're both pretty horrible systems. Right. Um, and they both have progeny and continue to linger. And you see it in our prisons. We, you know, we black and brown people are, are grossly disproportionately incarcerated relative whites in our society. And yet we don't just have the most incarcerated black and brown people on the planet. We also have the most incarcerated white people on the planet. And yet all of those folks, like 90% of them come from families that were too poor to afford to, to pay for a lawyer for. Mm. And so we have to really just kind of recognize that while kind of each tradition of oppression in our society is different in its origin and in many ways in its practice, that they all weave together, reinforce each other, and ultimately have the net effect of trapping poor people uh, of every color um, in some type of misery that, quite frankly, we can undo. And that's what Dr. King was, uh, you know, assassinated trying to do. He was assassinated leading the poor people's campaign. He, he thought he, you know, uh, when he got to the end of the march, the plan was to commit uh, civil disobedience on such a massive scale that the leaders and perhaps dozens of others would end up, and maybe hundreds of others, would end up in prison for five years. Like Dr. Wow. King's sense of moral urgency to really uh, transform our national mindset uh, so that we could finally end the war on poverty that LBJ had started but had stalled by the, by the end of the 1960s um, was so profound uh, you know, that he was, he was prepared to go to prison far longer than he ever had. And at the very least, we as progressive activists and leaders can at least keep our eye on the ball and figure out, you know, how, how do we raise the, the minimum wage to $15 across each of our states? You know, how uh, do we ensure that every American has access to quality, affordable health care? How do we uh, probably end mass incarceration, stop wasting all of that money uh, in all of those lives? How, you know, how do we ensure there's a high quality teacher in every classroom so that we can then build other educational reforms on top of that, um, you know, whether it's extending the school day, extending the school year, you know, creating more ways to learn. But until you actually have uh, a great teacher in every classroom, all of those other reforms will simply be less effective. So, you know, that's, um, that's why I'm running for governor, because I see a moment right now where we can bring working families together across every line that has historically divided us, uh, race, region, religion, get us all on the same side of the table confronting the problems uh, together, solving the problems together, breaking down the problems that confront our families and big problems and the small problems and getting rid of them, as opposed to staying where we are, which so often is on opposite sides of the table, picking at each other while those pro problems continue to mount and grow. Right. So, I mean, how much does there need to be... Uh... How different are the messaging and the policies that help working white class people versus working class people of color? I mean, we, we hear this thing uh, lately where people talk about the white working class uh, as if it were just interchangeable with working class, as if the only working class people were white. And it totally invisibilizes all the people of color who are working class. And I'm not sure, honestly, where that comes from. But how much... Um, what do you, are the, the policies that will, and this is kind of a, a more general question beyond gubernatorial, but I think it influences uh, state level policies. I mean, how different are these policies or how, how universal are they? How across the board are they? How much micro targeting needs to happen versus policies versus providing things that, that really help everyone? Yeah, well, I think it's kind of, how do I say this? I think we pay attention in some ways. We pay more attention to white working class voters who, for instance, voted for Obama and then voted for Trump um, because it's more obvious. 
but black working class voters, uh, many of them, you know, similar sort of numbers and it's really important as far as Trump's margin of victory, just didn't vote. Mm. And what, what confounds me is they call the first group crazy and they call the second group lazy mm. and nothing could be further from the truth. In each case, people, um, came to rational conclusions. We may disagree with them. We may, you know, I think we can certainly argue they could have made a better decision, right? But um, nonetheless, they came to a rational conclusion. In one case, hey, I tried something, uh, voting for Democrats, and you didn't give me the results I wanted, so now I'm voting for Republicans. Or in the other one, hey, I tried this thing, investing my time in voting, and it hasn't changed my life, so I'll go invest my time in something else. And, and you've got to start from that perspective with voters, one of empathy and understanding and respect, and then come to them and say, all right, well, now I want you to try something else um, because we've, we've got a plan. We can make work pay again so that you only have to work one job to provide the basic necessities for your family. We can you know, get transportation working again so that uh, say in Upton, where the uprisings were in Baltimore, the neighborhood where my family started its journey in Baltimore, um, you know, so that the bus will get you downtown faster than you can walk. Because right now it takes 45 minutes either way on the bus or on foot. You know, it right. doesn't really help you get, get to your job any faster. You know, hey, you know, let's try something new. We can uh, actually ensure that that money that the casinos are generating that we promised you would. Uh, be added to the budget for education to provide a better education for your children, but that actually happens. And um, and so that's what you know what 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 we're doing. And it's it's unfortunately, Katie, you, you know, a lot of what we've done isn't new. It's like it's just stuff we've done before. Like there was a day when the uh, you know, before mass incarceration, we can get back there. There was a day when public universities were essentially free. Uh, sometimes they had like a, a student services fee, but they didn't have any tuition. You know, we can get back there. There was a day when the minimum wage uh, had actually kept up with inflation. We can get back there. And we can also similarly respond to, um, you know, the needs of this moment, like making sure everybody has access to quality, affordable health care. But in order to do it, we all have to be willing to actually have faith, work together, push hard, keep our eye on the ball, and get these things done. And, you know, it's um, – people say, well, you know, how, you, how, how are you going to pay for it? It's like, ah, well, we can close corporate loopholes. We can end mass incarceration. We can – you know, actually come together and get our economy growing faster. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's any number, in the case of healthcare, we can confront big pharma. You know, we can actually, we're spending a lot of money, we can spend it more effectively if we're actually, you know, uh, essentially buying in bulk as a state. Um, so I have a term, term I guess, you know, coming out of the Bernie campaign last year and yeah, I see a great opportunity to, to, to kind of get us beyond defending Obama's le legacy, really focus on extending it, going even further to, to provide health care coverage, for instance. And, and in the case of the Bernie campaign, to actually begin making some of the dr dreams that hold all of us together real state by state. Yeah, what is it? I mean, I, I feel like some people are trying to – I don't know whether they really believe it or they're just framing it this way, but they are claiming that the takeaway from the election is to be more centrist. You know, I, you hear someone, I, I cite this a lot, but Jen Palmieri, who was Clinton's um, communications director, saying that people who are who are protesting, it's not about fight for 15. It's, it's about something else. I mean, this weird explicit rejection of kind of programs that, the bolder programs that Sanders put forward. Can you talk about, uh, I mean, it's a bit of a leading question, but what do you think the takeaways are in terms of what people respond to? You know, we fundamentally have to make a, a decision uh, about whether we cast our lot um, ultimately by building a bigger coalition at the base of our economy, or we try to you know, pull back 
some folks who may have once been Democrats and are now Republicans. And when I look at the, the demographic shifts in our society, when I look at the economic realities in our society, not only are there more voters to be organized and mobilized at the base of our economy, but there's more good to be done by doing that. You know, we don't get to be uh, the nation that we've always dreamt of being until we end poverty. You know, we don't get to be the nation that we've always dreamt of being you know, until, um, you know, my little girl and other little black and brown Asian Native American girls growing up in this society, uh, uh, you know, as well as suburban white girls growing up in this society, can actually dream to go as far as they want to go and know that no one's, no one's going to stop them. And, uh, and that means, yes, we, we have to deal with sexism. We also have to deal with racism. And we also have to do with intract, deal with intractable poverty in our society. And, and, and politics always works best when you actually organize the voters who have self-interest uh, uh, in breaking down those barriers and we're strongest, quite frankly, when we're organizing uh, the voters who have interest in all three, or at least two you know, right. of those. And so, you know, that's that's where I've always, you know, cast my lot is in uh, organizing working class communities, you know, black, brown, white, Asian, N Native American. And what about the idea that uh, this, this dichotomy of is it racism or economic anxiety and, and, and what's the relationship between those two things? I mean, I thought that the takeaway from history, like the Holocaust, all that stuff was like when, when there's economic anxiety, all those things get exacerbated. People are that much more um, susceptible to a leader like Donald Trump. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Fundamentally, we have to make a choice right now. You know, the, uh, we're in one of those moments where, where people's angst, their anxieties are rising. And there's an old playbook, and Donald Trump's picked it up, mm. of naming scapegoats and turning people against each other. And there's enough history, history in my community, in your community, in every community, that tells us beware when people do that. Because this is when we're about to get played or worse. The alternative is to decide to come together, to say all for one, one for all. They come for one of us, they come for all of us. And even better, if we band together, we can get, you know, we, we can quickly shift from playing defense to playing offense and actually get back to making the world better for our kids. And that's why I'm running for governor. As somebody who spent their life building movements, as somebody who spent a lot of their career, that do now investing in growing small businesses, I see an opportunity to build a movement that makes it easier for all of us to prosper together. Thank you so much, Vangelis. How does your, you, you, one of the many things you worked on as the head of the NAACP, and you were the youngest, of course, and, uh, chair of the NAACP, one of the many things that you worked on was a marriage equality referendum. And there, you know, you reached out to people that, uh, from what I can tell, this campaign was about speaking to people who didn't already agree with you. Can you talk about that, how that, what you learned from that, and also how that kind of applies to, to organizing, not just around marriage equality, but other issues? Look, you know, the, the uh, year I fell in love with politics in Maryland, 2012, 2013, we uh, had several big civil rights uh, demands we were trying to push through the state legislature. And the old folks, you know, who run uh, things down there were really not pleased. They're like, you know, you, you all just try to figure out, like, whose year this is. Uh, because we were seeking to pass the DREAM Act, pass marriage equality, abolish the death penalty, pass sensible gun safety reform, uh, and expand, and expand uh, voting rights protections. That year we tried something different, you know, rather than doing what they asked and getting in line and, you know, deciding that maybe one or two of us would get our issue through that year, but the other three or four would have to wait. We, um, 
we actually listened to the young activists who said, you know, there's this new math. It's called addition um, in this democracy where we're forced to try to secure minority rights with majority votes. If we just adopt the motto of the three musketeers and say all for one and one for all, we can actually get more done. And so we came together, and that meant for me, actually, we you know, hired organizers of the NAACP to work with the black religious community and you know, other, other groups in our kind of broader black community in Maryland uh, to get them on board for marriage equality. Um, it also meant that we were out there organizing on behalf of the DREAM Act. But it meant that we also had help from others helping us um, organize uh, to, uh, you know, to abolish the death penalty. And, um, and we won every battle that year. And that's, that's what, you know, really buoys me in these, in these moments, Katie. I know, I, I know that, that not only can we, can, can we, the coalition, the willing come together and get things done. I know that we can expand that, you know, the, the size of, that group just simply by talking to folks, by listening and to asking and, and asking leaders one by one to put themselves in somebody else's shoes. Um, so, you know, that's the work that's at the heart of this campaign. And that's part of why we have faith uh, that, you know, come next June, uh, we will win this primary. Are you saying that it's not racist and catering to racism to try to talk to a coal miner? The, um, I, I don't even know how, how to answer that I question, and I, and I got to de- pick okay. up my kids. But okay. you know what I am saying is that we are strongest when, when we when we listen to each other. We're strongest when we fight for each other. We're strongest when we recognize what Dr. King told all of us, which is not only to choose love because hate is too hard to bear, but that no matter what we think, we're actually all inextricably linked together. And there's no way uh, for all of us, for any of us to really prosper in the end unless we find a way to work together to make each of our lives better, each of our communities a bit more free, each of our children's destinies able to soar a bit higher. Great. Well, thank you so much, Ben Jealous. You got my vote. Thank you. Even though I don't live in Maryland. All right. You got my spiritual vote. Okay. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Bye.